Perfecto. All right, carry on. Have All right, everyone. Welcome to the most exciting topic I think I've ever delved into. Distance learning and copyright. I did uh, copy this link into the uh, chat if you want to just follow along on your computer instead of what I'm presenting. Um, so let's see what happens here. Um, are you seeing? There we go. It's popping up now. And let's go to full screen. Let's put the chat on. All right. Um, yeah, we've been bouncing this topic around for quite a while here at Chisaga Lakes and now with COVID and all the things that seem to be open and free because you know we had to switch distance learning was was uh quite heady for some teachers that oh cool we can use this we can use that we can use all these different things and we don't have to worry about it well yes and no so what i thought i'd do is just kind of walk through some of the things that i've picked up and learned about this and we can just kind of have a discussion as as soon as the uh, as the slideshow is done, I do have some videos in here that I am not going to show in the meet because that doesn't work so good. So that way, that way, if you click on your link, you can watch these as you have time or whatever. But back in 1976, they decided that they were going to make a major renovation, a major change in the copyright laws, which hadn't changed since 1909. Now, I was thinking 1976, that was my second full year of teaching. What was the technology like back then? Anybody venture to guess what kind of technologies we had back in 1976? Uh, film strips, overhead projector, the mimeograph machine that went boom, 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 boom. And then you'd smell the ditto machine papers as they were passed back. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, so technology back then was a little different than what we're thinking about now. But in 76, they had three sections to the copyright law, and section 107 was fair use which means that you could use works that were copyrighted for criticism, commentary, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. That seems reasonable. Section 108 was allowing libraries to copy, photocopy, whatever, for archival and for interlibrary loans. And then section 110, which is the one that probably pertains mostly to what we're doing now. Subsection one was exemptions for the performance display rights for nonprofit physical classroom settings. So that means face-to-face. -face. Where subsection two was containing exemptions for digital transmission for accredited nonprofit online and distance education settings. So that was the major revisions in 76 that helped us have a little more control over what we can and can't use in the classroom. Then in 2002, and we know that technology has improved a little bit since 76 to 72, we have the TEACH Act. And that basically dealt with section 110, subsection two, where provision that enables educators to use copyrighted material for distance education with certain restrictions. And that's what I'm finding with all of these things, that there are restrictions. It's not just a free-for-all. It's not just the wild, wild west, but there are considerations that you have to make for each of these different ways that you might be 
be able to use copyrighted material. So the TEACH Act facilitated and enabled the performance and display of copyrighted materials for distance education. That makes sense. That's kind of where we are right now. Fair use, which is a term that you hear a lot of. Well, you know, it's, it's fair use. I'm using it in my classroom for education. Well, this describes a condition where limited use of copyrighted materials is allowed. And then my favorite is asking permission. If you get a license from the copyright holder, if you get written permission from the copyright holder to use the material in the way that you state it, that's the best way to do it. So let's take a look at those three a little bit closer and kind of go into what you can and can't do with each of these. And at the top, I've got a Teach Act checklist, which I've done for each of these three that kind of helps walk you through it. But let's just go through the slide first and then we'll take a look at that checklist. So the work you're using must be lawfully obtained. It can't be a ripped copy of a CD or a DVD or a Disney movie. It can't be pirated and it can't be, music teachers love this one, a copy of a copy. Well, I, I've got 16 of these and I only have four of those. And so how's that gonna work? Then the second, thing to think about is limited use, you know, only using what you need. It must be important to the content of your curriculum. It can't be one of those, oh, movie Fridays, you guys earned a reward, so we're gonna watch a Disney movie. No, 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 no. And then the third thing, the limited use, you know, to actually students that are enrolled in your class, it can't be just thrown on your web page and anybody in the world has access to it. This is where LMSs would be very helpful where you put it on your LMS and just the kids that are in your class have access to the materials. Now, one thing I saw here that I thought was very interesting that we don't have yet at Chisago is the schools must have a copyright policy in place. And I've also read that re reviewing that each fall, like you do with bloodborne pathogens and right to know and all those things, should be a part of the staff training each fall in your staff workshop days. So here at Chisago, we are working on it. The last one that we worked on was uh, 2014. And we're just kind of now reviewing that and looking at other examples from other districts. So I'm going to ask anyone on this call that if your district does have a copyright policy or something similar to that if you wouldn't mind sharing that with john and he can put together some type of a document that we can all have access to so we can kind of work together to come up with this um, i looked online to try and find some templates where you could just kind of plug in your school's name to these and not that easy to find so i did um, find some examples of different school policies um, and that I can share out with John also. Um, no downloading student devices, which I thought was interesting, but you can use it as asynchronous learning. So putting them up on your LMS so the kids can access those as they need to or review them, how many times they need to go back and relearn something um, is permitted. And it does not include materials that you would normally buy for the students. You know, textbooks, you can't just cut off the back, put it in a copy machine and let it run. Uh, workbooks, consumable materials that the kids would use, recordings, course packs, etc. So let me pop out of this real quick and go to that Teach Act checklist. And this is from the University of Texas Library. So a lot of the sources I found were university level materials. Um, very hard finding some of the same things for high school or middle school or elementary, but these could easily be used by anybody just to go through and check and see. Is it a nonprofit? 
is my class part of the regular offerings of my institution? So you can go through this on your own and just see what things you would check through to see yes, yes, no, yes, no. And then you can just kind of make your decision. Does what I'm using follow the tenets of the TEACH Act? So let me go back to the presentation and please stop me if I'm rambling on or if you have a question or you have a comment or a better way of looking at this, I would appreciate the input. Moving on to fair use, again, a checklist for fair use and we'll take a look at that in a few minutes. Um, fair use in seven words is a video from the University of Virginia's library. Take a look at that. It's, it's very concise into looking at these four different things that you need to consider when you're saying, oh yeah, this is gonna be fair use. What's the purpose and the character of the use? Okay, educational alone does not automatically constitute fair use. If you're going to use it as transformative, you know, satire, parody, the meaning of the message is new, the expression is new, and yes, that would give it the, the purpose that you need for fair use. And the nature of the copyright. Um, primary factual materials versus creative materials. More chance of making your claim a fair use if it's a scholarly paper that you're using or technical works versus somebody's creative play, musical, movie, paintings. Okay, and then the amount is very important if you're using half of the movie or half of the poem or half of the book versus only 10% of it may not be as good a claim to fair use. And then they also have this, is what you are using the main part or the heart of the work. That can have an effect on it. If you're using some supplemental things that lead up to that, that's fine. If you're using the main part, I'm just gonna show the uh, color part of the Wizard of Oz movie. Not the black and white on each hand, but just kind of the middle. But you know, that probably wouldn't be fair use. And then the effect. How is this gonna affect the income that the copyright holder would get if you are using their materials? Is that gonna impact them? So let's take a look at the fair use checklist. A little bit different style. This is from Penn State Libraries. But here they've got these on this column would be in favor of fair use. The ones here would not be in favor of fair use. And you can kind of go through it and see, you just check things off. Yes, it fits in this one. No, it doesn't fit in that one. And then you have your determination at the bottom by looking at the things that you've checked off here. Is this really going to be a fair use or not of the copyrighted material? Back to the presentation. And doing okay on time, good. And then this one's my favorite, asking permission. You're, if you can find the copyright holder, if you can get permission from them, and sometimes it takes a number of times to, to find the right person to contact or the right person to ask or the right publisher to ask. But it is worth your time if it's something that's really important to you and it might not fit the other ways of doing it. Let's see what's changing. Yeah, I do you want me to ask a question, Mark? Yeah. Please. My question is just does a school district have to meet both the Teach Act like checklist and the fair use checklist, or are there situations where only one is applicable? I would say if you go through and say, well, this is more likely to be approved if it's under the Teach Act. I would just go with that one. If you think it's because of the things that I outlined here, if it's more of the fair use, then definitely I would go with that one. I don't think you have to check every box you know, all the way down, but to be safe, you know, going with one or the other, whichever one fits best for what you're trying to do or the material that you're trying to use. 
Okay, thank you. Yep. So permission, finding out who holds a copyright. Is it an individual? Is it a piece of artwork that you want to use as an example? Is it a poem? Is it um, some other creative work? It might be a, a chapter in a book that you want to use. Then you contact the publisher and see what kind of uh, permissions or license they would need. And then also check a publisher's website. They have a lot of information on there about using this for fair use. And then when you contact the copyright owner, please put in that information that telling them what you are using this for. Tell them how much you are using. Tell them how you want to use it. And like I got at the bottom there, it takes time, so plan ahead. Don't just think, oh, it's Friday. I better ask permission because I'm going to use this on Monday. No, this should be planned way ahead. And then document everything that you're doing so that there is a, a, a flow chart of, okay, I found this, did this, contacted this person on this date. They replied back or they didn't reply back. Try it again. And then if you do get permission or license thing, make sure that you get it in writing so that you've got documentation. So if something comes back later and says, you did not have permission to use this, you can pull out the documentation and say, yes, I've got it right here in writing. Now the permission checklist is a little bit different from the other ones. It's not really a checklist, but it is a number of steps that you would need to go through to secure that. And the first one is, I think, really common sense, but you don't always think of it. Determine if permission is needed. If it's something that's in the public domain, you don't need permission. If it's something that's um, under Creative Commons license, you don't necessarily need permission depending on um, what the license is for that. So, and this one, again, you can go through on your own and pull out parts that, that make sense and um, go that route if that works for you. So let me go back here, getting close to the end. So how to avoid copyright issues, create your own material. Instead of using somebody else's graph or data or whatever that's copyrighted, create your own graphs or images or content. Second thing would be to consider using stuff in the public domain. And I've got three different links here that provide tons of material, but it's dated material. It's older material that has either lapsed from its copyright and is now in public domain or the author forgot to renew it or it was never copyrighted in the first place. So Gutenberg Project, uh, Internet Archives, and Wikimedia Commons all have material that can be used copyright free. Most of the content from the US government is free to use. So if you've got statistics for a geography class or history class or something that was created by the US government that's in the federal archives, that's most of that stuff is copyright free. And then if you consider using stuff that's been created but has a co Creative Commons license, those are really pretty open too. And they have different designations for whether it's for um, nonprofit use, whether it's for profit use, what type of licenses they have. So I have a link there to Creative Commons to help you navigate their different types of licenses. There's a video here, Creative Commons in plain English, that kind of just walks through the steps of what that system does for the different creators and how they can license their materials and have some control over how it's used. And then if you link to files that are on the web, that's pretty safe, but it's still a good practice to ask permission, say that, okay, we're, we're going to your website, we're linking to this document that you created, is it okay for us to do that from our LMS? And then look for open educational resources. 
I put this document together a few years ago that have all these open educational resources available to to anybody, and I've kind of put them together by um, subject matter. And then I've created two slides here for additional resources, everything from copyright and creativity, Creative Commons, open educational resources. The two from the University of Minnesota is kind of what got me started on this that came across my desk and I started looking into it and reading up about it and how you know, COVID and our distance learning and hybrid learning have kind of changed things around a little bit. So I uh, added those in there. I think they're good resources to at least read through and get a better idea, a better handle on how this goes. And then some things that because of the pandemic, the copyright community, the uh, publishers have got some websites and what they are allowing teachers to use. And then two more uh, videos here um, that you can go through at your own leisure. Um, they're kind of interesting. The fairly used one is very creative at first, but then it gets kind of annoying after a while. And then my disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, so this is not legal advice that I'm giving you, but I feel like I, <laughs> I am one after reading all this stuff. So. Now I will open it up to questions or comments or things we can share. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen here. I, I popped this into the chat, um, but I just wanted to point out the described and captioned media program. That was a find that we stumbled onto in distance learning. Um, it is completely free. Um, and it is paid for through the Department of Education. And it is a great resource for videos. Our health department was looking for videos that they normally showed in class, but you know, they had purchased the DVD and like, how do we send this out in distance learning? And we found many of them were already available for free um, at the DCMP website. Um, so put that on your radar, especially if you're looking, if you have staff who are looking for videos or even, you know, future purchases, like, hey, I want to buy the DVD for this. See if it's there. Also, it's a great resource because um, closed captioning should never be an option. It should just be mandatory. And right. that's what the whole thing is about. Um, often those videos the captioning is also available in another language. So if you have ELL students and they're watching To Kill a Mockingbird, they could get, you know, maybe the captions in Spanish or something. So make sure to put that on your radar. That's a really good one. I'll add that to the slides for the three o'clock then. Thank you. Any yeah. other comments? Ben. Hi, Ben. I was just sure. going to say, I'm so linear. It feels like if I'm following the history correct, because I have to keep it really simple in my mind, and I'm thinking of how we train our staff in the fall, that fair use is kind of the big umbrella, and Teach Act is only for distance learning. Is that correct? State that again. Okay. That, that, because the 1976 copyright law kind of set up fair. Fair use. So that's kind of the big one. And then because that section 110, subsection two is distance learning, that's what teach changed, right? So right. fair use is kind of when they're in the building, they teachers would use all that. If they're in the distance learning setting, then they would use the Teach Act checklist. Yeah, I'd say the fair use has been around the longest. It's kind of the, the largest umbrella covering uh, copyright. And that would be more dealing with face-to-face -face where, yeah, section 10, subsection two would, of the TEACH Act then would be more of what we're doing with hybrid learning or distance learning or online learning for like Wildcat Academy. That helps me keep the things straight in my mind. Thank you. But this is, again, a group collaborative 
administrative thing here. If we really need to get technical, we call in the district lawyers and have them explain it to us because we're, we're kind of going through this minefield as best we can. Yeah, Ben's comment about watch what you put on your websites as far as photos. Um, and what I always try and do when I'm in searching for Google Photos is to use the user rights part and then select the um, available for, for any use. It's not licensed, it's not copyrighted, or it's copyrighted for uh, Creative Commons. Anything else that we can discuss or help you with? We've kind of used our half hour, but. Mark, that was a really good presentation. I really appreciate it. It's uh, for musicians. Um, uh, I'm a part-time music teacher. Um, and um, you can get licenses if you want to do synchronization. And although sometimes you have to pay for it. Um, although in the pandemic, a lot of people are giving permission without money. Uh, without without compensation, which is good. So I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of lawsuits during the pandemic, but you've got to we we've got to shape up because it's very expensive if you get caught. Uh, communities of faith have had to pay more than a hundred thousand dollars sometimes if uh, they are not careful with their copyright as they just share various material, and that's happened local. Well, maybe I can't maybe I shouldn't say, but let's just say it happens throughout Minnesota. Yes. Yes, and as a former music teacher, I know that that's something that's always kind of weighing on your mind. Well, if I just make this one copy and then destroy it after, I'll be okay. That's not okay. Or if it's pop, if it's permanently out of print, do I still need to get permission? Yes, you do. You know, it's all those little things that, well, you know, I'll get by with it this time, but it's not worth trying to just scoot around the rules. Well, and it's too easy to fall into a bad habit. I mean, right now, like you say, well, they're not gonna go after you during a pandemic or it's less likely. Well, if you're in the habit in the pandemic, later you're gonna be like, well, I've been using it for a year and a half. What? Why now? Well, be aware. And have to be good examples for our students too. It's not just the teachers that are responsible for this. If the kids are creating content, they should be aware of, of what they're doing also. They can't just use any song off the internet. My son found that out when he was posting something on um, Instagram, where Instagram said, yeah, you can use 30 seconds of this. And then they pulled his post off. He went to TikTok and found out no, you only can use 15 seconds of that. So it's, you know, it's a balancing act of what you can and can't use or what's fair use versus having to ask permission. So. And Mark, oh, I John chiming in yeah. as a former media director, I mean, that whole idea of setting the good example as being stewards of, of copyright and following the law is critical because students do look at us teachers and go, well, why do we need to follow copyright when they, you know, picking on music people because that seems to be the <clears throat> the ones that know how to use the copy are the best. And uh, <laughs> how come they can have a, uh, uh, a room full of file cabinets that have copies of the music it, you know, it's like, come on, folks, we can do better than this. Well, if I could just say that um, legally, you can use, uh, you can make copies if you own legal, legal. Uh, so in other words, uh, if you have 25 originals that you purchase from the publisher, um, generally speaking, it's been considered that you can make photocopies for the kids to use photocopies, but then you should destroy them. Um, because really you're just, and then you should not use the originals. The originals need to be in your bookcase then uh, because you cannot uh, get around it by cheating, by making more copies than you own. Right, right. And so when you, when you have 25 copies and you make 25 for the students to use and next year we've got 40 kids, yeah. it doesn't mean you can use 40 of them. <laughs> you're absolutely right. 
And, and I, I, I think there's a lot of schools that are vulnerable because they're not careful. I also have seen a lot of music teachers and maybe other teachers as well doing the same thing. It's difficult because then you don't want to be over your budget. But I'll tell you, if you do get caught, you will be over your budget. And I would guess you might lose your job when they find out you cost the district several hundred thousand dollars. But I don't know. Most of the college stuff that I was looking at say that it is the responsibility of the instructor, not the responsibility of the university to make sure that you are following copyright law. So that would come down to that person, not to University of Minnesota getting sued. It would be this person teaching this class using this material. So I thought that was interesting. Whether it's actually going to come down to that, I don't know, but. You know, I just emailed our um, HR, and, but okay, we've got to get going on this policy and we've got to add it in the fall training. I mean, part of it is to cover ourselves. Like you just said, then we as a district have provided what we need to, and then accountability would lay with the teachers. Um, like, I don't want to be sued. <laughs> like, and I, I do think, you know, somebody said it, that lots of, things have happened this year with circumstances being the way they are this is the right time to try and say okay thing you know a lot of people probably wouldn't pursue it in the middle of a pandemic but by next fall guess what there if it was me and i owned something i'd start looking mm -hmm. and and it's always <clears throat> yeah and disney has already indicated that uh, they have their feelers out and are and that greedy little mouse is gonna, <clears throat> and I don't say that lightly. Uh, the, he is a greedy little mouse. <clears throat> well, folks, I think we've we've uh, reached the end of our time and being cognizant of that, I will uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, this recording will be available uh, for quite some time. We'll put it up on our ECMEC uh, YouTube account shortly, uh, probably tomorrow actually. Um, and if you, uh, if you have other, uh, other needs for things to be, uh, done in this kind of a fashion, uh, please don't, uh, 